taking you through a story. And uh, the story, as far as I know it, began in uh, around 1998. This is the story of a young man at that time by the name Shekhar Murthy, who just finished with uh, his master's in finance in Columbia University, New York, and just got placed into a startup company called Startup Date run by Nimish Sarkar. You know, first job, a lot of stress, a lot of uh, uncertainty, and Shekhar was kind of battling with these things. He was not sure whether he was getting up in the morning and going to work for anything productive or whether he was just, you know, making photocopies for colleagues. But slowly, slowly, as you and I have found it at the beginning of our careers, things sort of settle into place. And while they were kind of settling in, in a couple of months, we had uh, Monica. Monica came on to the team at Startup Date. Now, Monica was a, a software professional. She had uh, software and management degrees, and uh, she was the tech lead. Normally, a tech lead and a finance person don't have much to do with each other. But uh, since it's Startup Date is a small company, they did. And when Monica had certain financial uh, matters that needed clarification, and the first time she went over to Shekhar, she found Shekhar was a jerk. And uh, she, was, she was really upset. Now, from Shekhar's point of view, he wasn't used to handling women. And uh, this was too close quarters for him. So he was, you know, if you guys follow friends, he was like Chandra, who would uh, make a stupid joke or uh, do some, something out of nervousness, nervous habits. And uh, Monica didn't get that. But what Monica didn't know is that uh, Shikhar had lost his mother when he was a teenager. And his father was a lawyer. He was at the bar in the mornings and at the other bar in the evenings, and there was no time that they spent together. But whatever little time that they did spend, Shekhar had to be a, a nice guy. He had to make sure that uh, his dad allowed him to do what he wanted to do. And therefore, he studied very hard. He got the scholarship, and he got out of India and started life afresh in the US. But those scars of a mother who dies when you're a teenager, those scars of uh, having to say yes when you want to say no, those are the kind of things that get imprinted on your subconscious. And Monica understood this over time. She understood this weakness of Shekhar and grew to accept it and love it. Now, friends, we're talking about the subject of consciousness, and we relate that to our conscious thinking, to our conscious mind, to our awareness of things. But actually, the mind is a distributed cloud computing system. And what we have within us is a conscious, which is small, and a subconscious, which is much larger. You know the typical iceberg diagram that a lot of you have always <coughs> referred to for various things, it applies here. And the conscious mind is not really where consciousness is built. The subconscious mind is where we already have connections over that cloud. And we pull those connections in to respond to our situations. So when Shekhar, as a teenager, was responding with a lot of anger for the neglect that he felt, but unable to express it, he was suppressing that anger somewhere. Because it's not in the conscious mind, it's in the subconscious, the anger is flaring up, and the conscious is pushing it down. And in that battle between the conscious and subconscious, 
we create a lack of alignment within ourselves, which is a lack of harmony, which is a lack of body, mind, spirit, harmony. Everything is on the body, mind, spirit. And that kind of disharmony could manifest in physical conditions like, uh, you know, ulcers and uh, tumors and cancers, stress related disorders, lifestyle related problems of today's medical world. Or they could result in emotional, mental problems like not knowing how to react socially, like not knowing how to respond to Monica. But anyhow, the good news is that Monica and uh, Shekhar did hit it off very, very well. Except Monica has a history as well. And in Monica's history is Avtar Kapoor, her dad, who he, he was kind of orthodox, all right? And he said that when he got to know about stuff like uh, this going on, he said, no, no, Monica, I've got better boys for you. And she says, no, Papa, I, I like this guy. I want to do things with him. And he says, look, you are in this world because of me. So you will do what I say. And those skirmishes actually had started in her college when she chose her subject. And ever since that age of 16, Monica had been feeling this lack of being able to build choice in her life. She was planting her subconscious between the ages of 10 and 16 with new stuff, new stuff that was disempowering with the thoughts that limited her. Now, the reason I say that is because you and I have been through similar situations. And all we have to do to renew our consciousness to begin with is examine where those were and how relevant they are, how long have we been carrying them. So, these guys, since they didn't get permission, they eloped. Yes. And you know, that could be the biggest slap that a child gives the parent. There, there's a lot of stress in getting married. There's a lot of stress in the whole family arranging a wedding, but there's far greater stress for the family when they have to explain what happened to their kid or kids as they went away. So these guys were not to be seen for quite a few months. And uh, since the job was then not available, our friend Shekha became a solo pranam. Often we feel that solopreneurs have a good life because they're doing what they want to and uh, on their terms and, you know, living the dream, so to say. But Shekhar found that the grass is greener on the other side because there are cash flow issues to manage every month. There are clients that you don't want to meet, but you have to wine and dine with. There are pressures that pull you away from uh, the security of knowing that your salary is going to come because there are other commitments that you have to meet first. So you are under a lot of stress as a solopreneur until you get your acts together. Now, one of the things that happened in their lives around this time is that they met a certain Guru Pranachandra. And this Guru talked to them about getting their act together through something called vibrations. So vibrations are everywhere, he said. In fact, all of our vibes, the way that we interact with each other, the way that our consciousnesses intermingle, interface, and we feel about ourselves and about others is through some sort of a vibration. He also explained that you can understand this vibration very simply if you understand that it is energy. Now, you know, everything for the scientifically minded, you have to agree, is made of atoms and atoms vibrate. 
So there are vibrations in the space around me. There are vibrations in these devices between us. There are vibrations inside us, around our plants, everywhere. Everything, our furniture, our pets, everything is vibrating at some frequency, which is different from ours, which is why we are not them. But if you look at uh, what ancient uh, oriental wisdom is all about, there is, there is a line that says, I am that. And that is a very empowering mantra because you then understand and get into anybody's vibration. So as you learn how to reset your vibrations and how to manage your vibrations from time to time, moment to moment, you sort of change the energy environment around you. And uh, when uh, Yash said I was a new inner power coach, that's what your inner power is really about. It's about the power that you have inside you to manifest change around you. So this knowledge of vibrations put them in a good space. In fact, such a good space that uh, within a few months of their being together, uh, Monica and Shekhar got married and she changed her name to Monica Kapoor Murthy because he was Shekhar Murthy. And she did that actually because she was already three months pregnant. And six months later, when Julian was born, they decided that Julian deserves to see whether the grandparents are going to be accepting of him. And so they went back to New York and the whole episode of Roshni and Avtar, the parent couple, with the meeting of the daughter, the prodigal daughter, and the uncalled for son-in-law happened. As you can imagine, it was not a nice situation. But you know what? Within minutes, when Monica presented Julian and the focus shifted to the little baby, Roshni, the mother, melted. The power of a child is so high because a child is so connected to nature, to purity, to pure vibrations. We are born with those pure vibrations, but as we go along, because of our social conditioning, because of our education, because of mindsets and the limiting beliefs that we've built up into our subconscious, which we've carried and uh, expanded upon, we stunt ourselves. For a child, everything is possible. You can scream wherever you want to. Consciousness at, the, at that level is really high. But coming back to society, what will people say? What will they think? What do we do? So Aftar was stuck with those kind of issues and he was really weighed down. Roshni got an idea. Roshni said, look, they have been away. We can say they were out in Canada and they're married, there's nothing we can do about it. Let's just throw a party. And so within a week of their coming back, Aftar and Roshni hosted a huge party. Lavish, they spent about $50,000 in 2004. And uh, everybody in their social circle got to know that, all right, Monica's married, nice guy. He's on his own, he's into finance. And then slowly over time, you know, it's very interesting how we, our consciousness makes us bicker about small decisions of a few dollars, but not think twice over decisions that may cost us $50,000 just to keep our social standing in place. That's the kind of consciousness that we contaminate our children with. And instead of allowing them to live their fullest potential, they live within the framework where they are acceptable, they're conforming with society. That's how it is. And we have to be cognizant of that to do anything about it. 
In a couple of years came Jatin. Now Jatin was an angry child. And have you wondered sometimes why some kids, even before they are one year old, they, they hold a toy and then they break it up and they express anger over it. And some others like Julian, are cool, calm, all right. Why this difference? What does the child really know? Not much, right? So where is this coming from? This is coming from another level that is imprinted inside us, inside our consciousness. And that level is the base of the, the uh, what is that called? The iceberg, right? So that iceberg has the conscious level, the subconscious level. And if you really go deep in to the bottom of the ocean, you're going to see the unconscious level. And this unconscious mind is the one that's connected with our past life streams. This unconscious mind is why we are pulling in those kind of emotions even before we logically or emotionally understand what we're doing. We can't form words, but we operate from a certain consciousness that we would regret operating from later in life. We don't know about it when we're that small. Nobody tells us about it for life, a whole lifetime for many people. But when you know about it, that's when you can start exploring. That's when you can take that deep dive into what's imprinted in those vibrations. What are those unconscious vibrations telling me? What vibes do I get? when uh, I'm not putting any conscious thought to it, I'm not putting any feeling to it, I'm just being me, where am I? What am I about? And so that is the beginning of getting started on your journey to renewal. Because now you've got this entire gamut of your own consciousness with you. And all you need to know are what are the tools that will help me deep dive into this? How do I go about it? So thanks to Guru Pranachandra, this couple was able to go about it. But you know, life happens. And when life happens, it happens outside your control. By this time, Shekhar was a door on Wall Street and it crashed. And he could feel his anger resurface. He could feel helplessness. There is nothing that he could do, possibly, however much he may have wanted, to change anything at that point in time. But he held on because change is the only constant. The only thing that you can do is align those vibrations and the cognition of them with everything that's changing around you. So embracing change is the hallmark of a person who's going to be stress-free because you are then capable of getting into that frequency of I am that. I am that change. I invited that change in a sense, probably through my unconscious mind, of which I have little understanding. But I know that there are people who have the tools that can help me get there. And that's the beginning of your making that change and studying those vibrations deeply. So, while these changes were going on in Monica and Shekhar's life, they took a decision that they would move to India. It's a good place to invest as an angel investor. Few investments which get you calculated returns and uh, you have assets in place and you can live a life where the kids grow up in a, 
a society that the parents are familiar with, have grown up in. Well, of course, Monica hadn't grown up there. She's grown up in the US, but uh, Avtar was very, very Indian. He had made a lot of money in real estate and uh, in the Midland and moved to New York only because the daughter had to pursue some job. And so, all right, let's go there. And because of that innate Indianness, that connection to his local language and his local customs, they both felt that, all right, when we go back to India, our vibrations are going to work. You know, they're going to match with the peer group there and we will be taken care of. But what they didn't budget for was habits. You get used to a certain way of life. Your entire consciousness in your economic, social, and uh, relational circles is different. You're used to certain things to buy. You're used to certain ways of buying those things. You're used to certain levels of noise. And uh, all of that changes. It's not just the which side of the road you drive on that changes. It's you know <laughs> the which side of the road all the traffic comes on that changes. And that can be unnerving. But again, you accept that change by working on your habits. The good thing about your habits is that they are physical things that you do. You may not have noticed, but a habit is not a mental construct. A habit is a physical activity. And if it's a physical activity, then you can get your body to do something physically till the mind starts accepting it. For example, what Guru Pranachandra told Shekha about his anger, which everybody said that you passed it down to Jadin, but that was not so. What would a one year old know about what his dad's traits are? No. What Guru Pranachandra said was smile. You cannot be angry or fearful or guilty or ashamed or any of those low vibrations that pull you down and smiling at the same time. And smiling is a muscular movement. You may feel quite stupid smiling when you're not happy inside, but give it 30 seconds and you will notice your consciousness changing from the inside you will start invoking your inner power to change your outer reality. You start getting comfortable, others around you start getting comfortable and conversations change. But habits, you know, are a lot deeper than that. Habits have a way of coming around because in Sanskrit, the word for habits is karam. It's actually the word for action. Habits are repetitive actions and karam or karma is repetitive action. So what you do becomes your karma. And it is for you in this lifetime, blessed you are to be human, that you can actually start focusing on every little habit of yours, every micro habit, like smiling is a micro habit, Twitching the, 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 um, the, the, the eyebrows is a micro habit, you know, something that I'm getting mindful of as I speak with you. But when you get aware of these habits, what happens is that this becomes your legacy, not only for your kids and for people in your circle of influence, your uh, colleagues and uh, other members of uh, family and others. This also becomes a legacy for your next life. Where is Jatin's karmic imprint coming from? From his karma. He was an angry man. And that got imprinted, that habit of being angry, of of being comfortable in that vibration, of thinking that that vibration serves me, what he died with. 
and that karmic imprint is carried over energetically, vibrationally, everything's energy into the mind stream. Now, a lot of you might not be totally in agreement with past life and uh, uh, you know life after life, but explain to me why kids today handle apps and technology devices better than uh, people who are 30 and above. Because it's the people who are 30 and above or the people who were 60 and above uh, 20 years back who passed away and came back with those karmic imprints of technology, of that aptitude. If Steve Jobs is back and I trust he is, he would be a, a 10 year old YouTuber earning millions of rupees or something like that. Or he may have an app in his own name already. You never know. But these things are manifesting around us. So there's obviously a reason why kids are better at these things. And that's why kids carry those kind of imprints in their consciousness, right? So that consciousness, how do we break it? How do we get the mind to start supporting us in this journey where the body is doing certain things, uh, but you know, the mind is, is not wanting to support the body in doing those things. I don't feel like smiling, why should I smile? Well, that's where a tool called gratitude is very, very helpful. Monica was very grateful to the Guru for having understood this. And what he said in a line is that anything that happens to you can be flipped around to understanding how it happens for you. He calls it the G24 principle. G for gratitude, two for it happens to you, and four for it happens for you. So, the Lemon Brothers did not happen to you. You don't have to victimize yourself because of that. It happened for you. Because now you know that you're bringing up your kids in an environment that resonates with ancient wisdom and values. Because now you have a solopreneur who's got the assets that allows him to build the kind of life that he had already, always dreamed of. But because of the machine that is New York, he still wasn't able to. Now he's an angel investor, he knows what to do. It happened for you, it didn't happen to you. Think about all the things and all the times that you've said that was a blessing in disguise. That blessing in disguise is only in disguise because you haven't acknowledged it the moment it happened. The COVID crisis is a blessing in ways that we have discovered after three months of lockdown. Some of us haven't yet. Some of us will. When we find that this COVID crisis was a dress rehearsal for a technology-based attack that happens across governments across the world. At least now we know how governments react, how people react, how communities react, how institutions react, how the medical system is equipped. We know. We wouldn't have known. And suddenly the robots would be on us. And suddenly the aliens would be on us. And suddenly other viruses would be on us. And they would be. What man is doing to the planet is, uh, is disastrous. Just uh, two weeks ago, sometime last month, there was a video on uh, YouTube. You could search for uh, permafrost, where there's a layer of permafrost in the Arctic Circle which because of global warming is breaking the land away. And there's this video of the land actually moving out. It's called a mudslide, but it's not. And in that permafrost are uh, viruses and bacteria and uh, a lot of methane. It's burned up a river in Siberia, in fact. All of that is coming out from the ice ages. So there's a lot coming. I don't want to sound like the a prophet of doom, but I want to tell you that you can be grateful for every small blessing. He also told Monica to be happy and to invest in what makes her happy. 
Because when you spend time with what makes you happy, you know, it makes your heart happy genuinely. Then you connect with your passion. And when you can bring your skills and your dreams together with your passion, you can find purpose. And when you find purpose, you get energy. Purpose lends energy. And energy, enhancing your energy, is the key to living a more fulfilling a life of higher consciousness. So that comes from your inner power. And it's for you to explore what makes you happy. Monica thought that when I was in college, I had this idea that I would uh, make some educational software for kids. Why don't I do that now? Now we have smartphones. There are things called apps that are coming around. Maybe I can put some, some way of kids to learn. I love kids. It makes me happy to write code, but not the kind of garbage code that corporates made me write before I had the kids. And now that I have my own kids, I can test it on my kids and see if they love it. And you know, she did that. And she made that app and set of apps and products and put them out and reached out to 100,000 kids in a few years while Shekhar was setting up his business. And Shekhar's business was driven not by the Wall Street earning money for him, but by he investing money and you know, calculating the odds with all his intelligence for making other people prosperous. And a lot of startup companies owe everything there is to him because he put their faith there. Prosperity is the highest level of purpose. Guru Pranachandra says there are five levels of purpose, but prosperity is the highest one. It's the one where you're not just driven by passion and energizing other people around you because you're passionate, but you are investing in others as they were doing with their educational products and with their financial support. Seed capital for so many others. And every year or every six months, you must benchmark yourself on how much time you're spending on prosperity of others and start increasing that because we are all busy being busy. That's the first level of purpose, performing. We just perform. But moving up the five levels, you can just focus on others and you will have a higher purpose. The way Gandhi had, the way Mandela, the way Mother Teresa had, and the way a lot of you also have. And now you know why it makes you get up and get out of the bed in the morning so excited because you have the energy. When you don't have purpose, you're tired and you feel the aches and pains and your entire consciousness is on a low. Right? So coming back to Monica, what she discovered in this process is that she's done a vibrational reset with all this. It's been a renewal from the inside. And this vibrational reset also reset whatever baggage she was carrying with her father. Because you can't be happy and uh, carry those ill feelings at the same time. You can't be focused on prosperity and on revenge at the same time. And she evened out her equations over years. But the funny thing that they both learned and I share with you is that the amount of time that we waste in getting about that vibrational reset is way more than the time we waste on any other activity in the entire living world. You think you waste time uh, playing video games or uh, chatting or gossip or this or that? Yeah, you need not do those things for inordinate times. But if you can just catch your vibrations and reset them in 20 days, let's say, instead of 20 years that it took Monica, she would not have had to have that fight 
with her dad in college and every time thereafter making her life at home so miserable that she had to elope and then get away from the country. All those defense mechanisms that we have built into our consciousness arise because our vibrational resets are too slow. The time wasting consciousness is something that you can start relooking at from the past, bring it to the present, consider it a blessing in disguise and patch up. Is it easy? Maybe. Do you need guidance? Maybe. But can you develop your inner power to do stuff like that? Yes. Resoundingly, yes. Now by 2016, all this was in place. Things were happy. And in fact, Avtar and Roshni also moved to India. The power of kids, still pure nature, the power of family. What are we doing in the US when even Monica has gone back home? So they came back. Besides, Avtar was looking for, uh, you know, so-called retirement. And so he kind of thought that it's better to do that back in their own country. But habits, habits die hard. As a shrewd businessman, he was not always above board in his dealings. And he started doing some dealings in India as well. And suddenly, 2016, demonetization came in. And he was one of those riches to rag stories. Not entirely rags, you know how to get around, but blown. Blown because it took a move like demonetization. And those of you not in India, suddenly one fine day on the 8th of November, the Prime Minister announced that the top rupee notes of 1,500 denominations are worthless. Get them exchanged in a 10 day window or use them as toilet paper. So a lot of people were not able to take their cash to the bank that fast and the banks were also not allowed to process large denominations together. And that's where the whole question of morality came in. There are two words which look very similar, consciousness and conscience. Conscience is what we overpower and that's what leads to moral decay. So, you know, in the last few centuries and increasingly in the last few decades, mankind has been going through a state of higher personal illness, higher mindless lifestyles, higher environmental degradation, social disintegration, and overall moral decay. Moral decay, I first heard that word when I was reading about the Roman Empire in school. The Roman Empire which perished because of moral decay. Never understood between school and now <laughs> that what is this moral decay. But I did understand that there's something called tooth decay. And if you have tooth decay, it pains like hell. And you run to a dentist. That is what's happening to morality around us. And it's for each one of us to just look at where our conscience lies and where it ought to lie with a conscious decision where we are invoking a connection with a higher consciousness. Maybe not ours, maybe not our subconscious. It does not allow us because it puts us in scarcity. We need more. I mean, we don't need more with that greed to think that we need more. We want more is the key. You need very little. In fact, the um, secret to happiness is to need very little. And uh, that, that, is, that is what the COVID crisis again has taught us, is teaching us. It's teaching us that we can live very happily on a minimalistic consumer buying uh, schedule, on no malls. No movies. We can make popcorn at home, for God's sake. Who knew? 
it's all entering our consciousness now. The reason I talk of the renewal of human consciousness today is because there are habits that we have embraced, which are serving our renewal. The air is cleaner. The water is cleaner. We are connected to our families. We must sustain these habits today in order for that renewal to actually become a social renewal, become a renewal of mankind. Otherwise, we're on a journey of self-annihilation. Now, the reason why I also choose the word renewal for this talk is because, yes, it is about renewing ourselves at a mind, body, spirit level, but it's about renewing our relations with others of our species and with other species. And all this talk about renewal is actually captured at renewalism.com, which is why you have that logo of renewalism and the site on the top right corner, renewalism.com. Dr. Yuval Harari, who's the author uh, and researcher of uh, the book Sapiens and Homo Deus, he says that when we were hunter gatherers, for every man, there were about uh, you know, every million tons of mankind, there were 300 million tons of wild animals. All right. It's easy to calculate. If you think about it, for every person, there may be about 10, 15 animals, and each animal weighs about 20, 30 times what we do. Oh, sorry, two, three times what we do. So totally, it's about 20, 30 times. So for, uh, into 10. So one is to 300 million tons was what the equation was there in uh, the hunter-gatherer days. And today, for 300 million tons, sorry, it is 30 million tons. Today, the human kind is 300 million. That's where that number was coming from. So one is to 30, you know, that, that was the ratio earlier. Today, the ratio is 300 million tons of humankind to 800 million tons of animals. 3 is to 8, 1 is to 30 versus 3 is to 8. And what's more shocking is that with complete lack of consciousness, we have domesticated for our consumption and for our entertainment 700 million tons out of that. Only 100 million tons of animal weight is actually wildlife. So I wouldn't be surprised, Guru Pranachandra says in the book Renewal, if mankind is to self-annihilate to a level of 1% of its population, because then that 300 million tons will become 3 million tons, which has the 1 is to 30 ratio with 100 million tons of wildlife. And we will relearn everything from scratch. And the habits that we had for our renewal, the connectedness that we have with nature, is the key to making that possible. And that oneness with nature, which respects 30 to 1 ratio of man to wild animal and lives by it and doesn't try to control the entire ecosystem. And in fact, Harari says that what man is doing in a few decades is going to be more damaging than what the ice age did. And we're seeing that with permafrost, with global warming. So guys, this is time to think about renewal. And the only way to think about it is mindfulness. Put your mind to what you do. And if each one of us do that, as Gandhi says, we can be the change we want to see in the world. You are the change. The byline of the book Renewal is your unexpected role in saving the planet. Get it. And remember, that your mindfulness is not about your logical mind, your thinking. No. Mind is connected to that distributed computing system, to that cloud, which is beyond space and time, which pulls out from your past life energetically what you are imprinting on it right now. So imprint the right things. Imprint with consciousness of the vibrations that you're operating from. And if you can get your vibrations to stop domesticating animals, for example, 
or stop what the vegans did, not just domesticating, but exploiting. Vegans have proved in a few decades that a small lifestyle change is capable of a revolution. Renewalism is that kind of a lifestyle change and you are part of it. So I welcome you to part, be a part of that at renewalism.com. I welcome you to be mindful of every aspect of your living, including your smiles, which are great ways to change vibration. It's a biohack. Thank you.